Okay, hello everyone. I uh, hope you're sitting comfortably and we're going to start this webinar on demystifying the enabling environment for urban sanitation. Uh, so my name's Sam Drabble. I'm Head of Research and Learning um, here at Water and Sanitation for the Urban Port and I'm going to be moderating this discussion. So I'm going to go through some, some housekeeping points in a moment but uh, wanted to start by giving you a high level overview of the ground that we're we're going to cover today. So the aim of this webinar is to explore what the enabling environment, quote unquote, looks like in practice. So the enabling environment for urban sanitation, it's a, it's a term that is increasingly used in the sector for, for good reason, because it's it's extremely important. But by the same token, the, the term is, is clearly not transparent and it's not, not necessarily easily understood. So what we're going to try and do in today's session is, is share our insights on, on what we think constitutes the enabling environment for urban sanitation and, and how we go about strengthening that in our program. So we're going to look at this from, from two perspectives and we're going to start by introducing WhatsApp's sector functionality framework. So this is a, a conceptual framework, an evaluative framework that, that we have developed um, and the aim of it is to, to present what we consider to be the, the core components of the enabling environment for urban sanitation. So I'm going to, to kick us off just by briefly um, introducing that framework. And then the core of the session is to look at concrete examples of, of how that plays out on the ground in our program. So what activities are, are WhatsApp engaged in um, to strengthen the enabling environment across our locations? Um, so we're going to hear from the people that are closely involved in that that work, leading that work. Um, so those are Amarul Hassan, our business development lead uh, in Bangladesh, Emmanuel Owako is our project manager in Kisumu, and, and Sibo and Daba, our business development lead um, in Zambia. Then we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to introduce um, an online simulation uh, that we have developed really to bring to life some of the, the challenges that, that we encounter in our programs around sanitation business development. Uh, so Rosie Renouf, um, who is again closely involved in, in developing that game, um, will introduce, give a demonstration and hopefully inspire some of you to play that. It's called The Bottom Line. And then we'll end with some, some closing reflections, particularly around um, the future application of the sector functionality framework. So we've got these two aspects. We've got the sector functionality framework uh, and what's up programmatic activities and what we're going to do is bring those together um, through the lens of one programmatic case study and that is a, a five-year um, Bill and Melinda Gates funded program um, which is just coming to an end now and the focus is on activating on-site sanitation markets so the, the focus is explicitly on-site sanitation um, and that program covered the, the three countries that, that we'll be hearing from today Bangladesh, Kenya and Zambia and I wanted to to outline quite an important point around the Gates program. It has an interesting story to tell relating to the enabling environment and our, our understanding of the importance of the enabling environment and, and how to go about strengthening that. So the Gates program was uh, separated into to two distinct phases. The aim was to catalyze the market for on-site sanitation. Um, in the first phase, we, we went about that through a business-centered approach. Um, that is to say that we developed and tested innovative sanitation business models. Um, two examples, uh, a business around distributing septic tanks in Chittagong and also a business model for container-based sanitation in Kisumu. And, and speaking honestly, um, we found that challenging. Um, those, those models that we tested were not successful and, and we've published and, and spoken openly about that and you can find more information about those business models on our website. And we derived from that first phase a, a very uh, clear insight which is that to develop scalable and sustainable FSM services um, we needed to expand our focus beyond this one link of the FSM chain and beyond direct support or, and direct testing of, of innovative business models and we, we needed to look more broadly, take a city-wide approach that aimed to address some of the barriers to business growth um, that came to light through that first phase of the program. So in the second phase, we, we pivoted towards a citywide approach. We, we channeled more resource towards strengthening diverse aspects of the enabling environment for, for FSM services, so supportive policies, incentives, regulations. So that's the journey that we've been on um, through the Gates program that you're, you're gonna hear more about. So this is the, the sector functionality framework that we've mentioned. This is um, our conceptualization of what the enabling environment for, for urban sanitation looks like. 
just to give you a bit of a history um, around this framework, so we developed this um, within the last two years. Um, initially, we developed one um, integrated framework about water and um, covering both water and sanitation. Um, but the reality uh, in some of the locations where we work is, is that separate frameworks we felt were necessary. So now we have two frameworks for water and sanitation, though clearly with substantial overlap. Um, so this is a sanitation framework. We have 27 indicators across nine areas, um, covering everything from investment planning and financial flows to consumer attitudes and behaviors. It's partially based um, on the UNICEF washback enabling factors categories. From WhatsApp's perspective, this, this framework has, has multiple applications. It has an evaluative application. And at the end of the webinar, we're gonna come back to this and I'll say some more about how we're using this to evaluate uh, sector functionality um, in our programs. But it also has a, a program planning application. So we use this framework to map our capacity development and sector influence interventions and to understand how all the activities that we're undertaking contribute to our to our end goal, which is um, sector functionality in, in the, the cities and, and the countries where we work. So what we're going to do now is, is explore how we went about strengthening the enabling environment uh, under the Gates funded program. And, and what we've done is, is mapped um, our Gates activities to this framework. So these are the specific indicators that you're you're going to hear more about, those, those colored dark blue here. I mean, it's important to state um, from the outset that we consider this framework to be an end state. Um, in our programs, we try to look across all these components um, and, and, and work towards strengthening all of these components in the long term, but within individual um, programs, um, Clearly, there are resource constraints, and we will tend to focus perhaps more narrowly on, on a subset of indicators. So today, you're going to hear primarily around institutional mandates, private sector enablement, service provider capacity, regulatory effectiveness, and, and, and two areas around consumer attitudes and behaviors. So you'll see this wheel cropping up across the three country presentations just to denote which, which indicator we're talking about and, and how the activity that we're talking about relates to sector functionality. Okay. So that's um, plenty of preamble from me. So we're gonna go now to our first presentation, which is Hassan, our sanitation business lead in Bangladesh. And he's gonna talk about our experience, particularly around developing Sweep, which is a, a fecal waste collection service. So over to Hassan. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you very much for a great start and introducing me uh, so nicely. The comfort part is I don't need to introduce myself. Once again. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for attending uh, this webinar today. Uh, today, I will share one of our interventions that particularly focused on strengthening the environment for urban sanitation in Dhaka, which is the capital of Bangladesh, and Chittagong, the second largest city in Bangladesh. So before I start, Let's have a look at the uh, sanitation, uh, urban sanitation context in Bangladesh. You know, Bangladesh is uh, one of the most densely populated countries in the world. It has, uh, it has a very low open defecation rate, which is close to 1%, but only around 60% of the population use any sanitation facilities. There is no sewage network in uh, the country except in Dhaka, which only covers 20% of the population. Therefore, household, business, and institutions are largely depends on onset sanitation system, mostly a toilet with feet and septic tanks. Hello. Uh, ne next slide. Hi Hassan, uh, we're going to bring this back to my screen because I think you're having some technical issues there in, in moving through slides, so just bear yeah. with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just also a, a housekeeping point which I neglected to mention. So if anyone has questions for Hassan, um, attendees are necessarily uh, muted because of it will present technical challenges um, if it's open for anyone to speak but we do encourage you to, to contribute of course and, and if you have questions you can um, put those to us in the chat box so as and when they occur to you please put, um, enter them there and, and we will put questions to, to each of the speakers at the end of their presentation 
Okay, sorry to cut you off there, Hassan. So, go on. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Under this context, uh, we have we uh, we we'll try to develop an intervention which mainly focused on improving three main areas, as because we found these three more uh, three areas is very crucial to make an enabling environment for Amazon. The very first one is institutional mandate, that means addressing lack of PRG, uh, who was responsible for Amazon delivery and recognition. And the second one, uh, private sector engagement, uh, that means supporting business to enter in the sanitation sector of Bangladesh. And the very final one, affordability and willingness to pay. This is all about balancing the commercial value of the business and affordability of low income customers. Next slide, please. So, from this flow chart of a human waste in Dhaka City, we can find the opportunity and challenges to scale up a efficient business model like SWIP. As you can see, only 20% of the population is connected to the sewer network, 80% depends on on site sanitation, 69% are connected to the surface drain, and only 9% is neither connected to the surface drain nor with the sanitation network, which often empty manually. SWEEP is currently responding to this 9% of the population. So therefore, we can understand there is a huge opportunity for SWEEP to city-wide scale up if we can bring 69% of the population into the market. But it's also a challenge because to do so, it requires a very effective enforcement of laws and regulations. But it is true that Unless until we can bring this 69% of the population who are connected to the sewer network, uh, sorry, the surface drain, there would be always a ceiling uh, on SWIP's future growth as well as the citywide solution of the problem. Please next slide. Okay, now let's go into deeper uh, how, uh, what, and how we have uh, done this. Actually, uh, WhatsApp has developed a efficient business model, uh, which uh, is called SWIP, and it has been implemented by the uh, under public partnership between a government utility bodies and private sector actors. Actually, it was uh, basically a lease-based agreement where uh, Thaka Washa leased out its vacuum tanker, mandated to work within this area, dumping provision, and the brand name SWIP to a private entrepreneur which is called Gushan Clean and Care, and in region, Gushan Clean and Care gives a security deposit, monthly lease fee, and certain commitment about the compliance of providing services. As we can see, there is a clear divination of roles and responsibilities of each party under the same bench. For example, private sector is responsible for regular operation, maintenance activities, receiving demand, whereas government body is responsible for mass marketing, regular regulation, replacing and increasing the fleet, Disposal and treatment. Sweep as a business, sweep as a FSM model, service uh, business model, it has been successful throughout the years. And most probably, it was one of the, uh, it was the first commercially viable FSM services in this region. And here I will share some performance data of Sweep, which bear the evidence of the success. Sweep so far have earned 102,000 USD as a revenue while making a 20,000 US dollar as a profit. But at the same time, it has served 265,000 people directly, emptying a 9,640 km liter of sludge. And now on an average, SWIP is serving 28% of the customer from the low income cluster. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So now the institutional mandate. We found that there was no clarity about who is institutionally responsible for FSM. Diwasha was responsible for sewage network, whereas City Corporation is responsible for surface drain. Therefore, FSM falls somewhere or nowhere in between these two. What's up? To, this, to, uh, to address this issue, was up with other like-minded organizations, pursued the government, and helped to develop an institutional regulatory framework for action in Bangladesh. 
And as a joint effort, this IRF has been signed as a law in May 2017, which is indeed a great achievement. In this new IRF, now the mandate has become very clear. City Corporation is responsible for, City Corporation has given the lead role to deal with the FSM, whereas Diwasha or Washa will play a supporting role in urban areas. In rural areas, municipality and Poroshua will take the lead role. Now, WhatsApp is working closely with the government to develop an action plan based on this IRF. At the same time, it's working with the government to orient the government utilities to realize their new roles and responsibilities under this framework. Next. So finally, you know, there was an increased need uh, to serve more and more customers from the LAC segment. With keeping the affordability of the service by the poor people, at the same time not hampering the commercial viability of the business. So Sweep responded to this by developing a flexible pricing strategy where it priced less, at least 40% less to the LAC customers than the usual price. And often the gap is bridged to cross subsidies. To make it sure, uh, to make it further sure that Sweep should serve the LAC customers, in April 2017, a clause of serving at least 30% of the people from, from LIC segment has become a contractual agreement, uh, contractual obligation for the enterprise. Next. So as I said, from April 2017, there is a clause of serving at least 30% from LIC customers in the contract. So from this graph, we can see the benefits, the impact of putting such a, such a clause in the agreement. As you can see, Sweep has started very well uh, in serving LSE customers in the beginning, but over the period, uh, the serving LSE customer has fallen drastically. But from April 2017, we can see there is a trend of increasing, uh, sir, in, increase of serving LSE people and it is, we believe it is because of such a clause in the agreement. Now, Sweep, from April 2017, Sweep is uh, serving on an average 28% of its customer from the LICs, whereas before it was serving below 20% of LIC customers previously. We used our Dhaka experience while we were uh, replacing, uh, replicating Sweep in Chiragong, and we put this very clause from the very beginning of the contract. Next slide. So, Sweep, the success of Sweep has opened a new window. You know, more and more utilities are have become more proactive to launch or uh, to start such service in their areas. At the same time, it makes the private sector more confident to involve and invest more in the central sector. As a result, Sweep is going to be scaled up largely in the two existing cities, that means Dhaka and Chiragong. And it also going to replicate into more uh, to, to, uh, different new cities, that is Rangpur and Orisha. From here, we can see the size of the market in terms of value and volume. For example, for Rangpur, it's, uh, it has a 1.6 million population and uh, it has uh, 1 million um, uh, Market size, the market size is $1 million annually. And Dhaka is a 60 million population city and it has got a 16.5 million DLT market size. Such as, uh, so as in the British, 1.9 million, uh, having a 2.5 million DLT annual market size, and Chicago, 4 million, having a 5 million DLT market size annually. I'm almost at the end of my today's presentation. I will conclude by sharing uh, some information about how closely this model and partnership is aligned to the achievement of sustainable development goal. By improving access to affordable and sustainable FSM, the partnership contributes towards achieving sustainable development goal six, clean water and sanitation, particularly 6.2, access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all by 2030. The partnership also responds to the focus on safely managed sanitation services. 
made possible through effective fecal sludge and wastewater management. Given the positive impact of improved sanitation on health, it also addresses goal three, good health and well-being. The partnership also fills the gap in service delivery through private engagement, thus also contributing towards goal 11, safe, resilient and sustainable cities. And 17, inclusive public-private partnership. Thank you very much for your time and uh, patience hearing. Thanks a lot. Please feel free to ask if you have any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Hassan. Uh, I apologize for the background noise. We did do some research around what time the call to pair would be, and, and we've, we've been caught out there. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll continue and, and come to Hassan with, with questions. Uh, so we've got a number of questions. We're not going to be able to go through um, all of these, for which I apologize, but we will address every question that is submitted. Um, if we don't have the time to, to put it to panelists today, then we'll include it in a, in a briefing document, which we, we will share in the next few days. Uh, so to pick out some of these questions, which I, I'll put to you, Hassan. Um, so Steve Sugden, uh, a very relevant question, who paid the capital costs for the original tankers under sweep? Uh, Norman Looker, um, so he picks up on the point you mentioned, Hassan, around a, a flexible tariff um, and asks what exactly we mean by flexible tariff. So it would be great if you could um, say a little bit more about that. Uh, and Vicky Ferrer asks, how long did it take to formulate then implement regulation? Um, so it would be helpful if you can talk a little bit more about the institutional and regulatory framework and, and where exactly we are in that process and, and how it relates to SWEEP. So those are three questions for you and we'll, we'll, we'll go back now to Hassan. Uh, well, first of all, you know, uh, that the, the vacuum taker has been given by UNICEF to Jiwasha. And, uh, you know, as I said, uh, in return, GWASH is receiving a uh, security deposit and a uh, uh, monthly lease fee. So lease fee has defined, uh, is designed in such a way which will cover the capital cost over a 10 period of time. And uh, after the 10, uh, 10 years of time, uh, 10 years of time, then GWASH will be able to uh, re uh, replace the fleet with the earning from the uh, current fleet. So at the same time, uh, we uh, as uh, asked the GWASH, uh, what is your future plan uh, about uh, scaling the business in the city and uh, in your areas? And he said, of course, we will try. And uh, as now we know that it is a good uh, source of money, we can make money through this business. Uh, we will approach our authority, even the local government division, uh, to uh, provide us fund so that we can buy our own uh, fleet by, uh, by our own finance. So this is how actually uh, the capital cost is recovering so far. Um, and flexible tariff means uh, actually, I know uh, the poor people in Bangladesh, they are uh, not capable uh, to uh, buy the sweep service at a usual rate. You know, uh, for example, I know the average cost of providing service is uh, $7.20, uh, which is actually uh, at, at, difficult for uh, for uh, uh, and poor people to uh, avail so that's why for poor people we are uh, charging less that is 40 percent less than the usual price and uh, at this, uh, which makes service applicable for the poor people too and we are the city is charging higher uh, for high income uh, customers and especially even more uh, from the institutional customers and often uh, the uh, loss uh, suffered by serving uh, the LSE customers is uh, subsidized by the earnings from the low-income institutional customers. As the third question, then, you know, the IRF has just uh, signed uh, signed as a law. Uh, it's just the beginning, uh, and you know, Tiwasha, uh, and uh, there was no clear mandate uh, of uh, who is responsible for everything. Uh, so uh, through this IRF, it has been become clear. So you know, City Corporation now is in the lead role, and as I, a City Corporation is uh, not prepared enough to take to serve this responsibility now. So it's just the beginning. Now we are working with the government closely uh, to develop an action plan. So that means uh, an action plan will be developed, and then uh, all the uh, you know city corporation course by municipality uh, will uh, make oriented to their new rules and responsibilities. Uh, yes, it will take time. 
he did that. And uh, yeah, this, was, this is just the beginning. Uh, there's a long way to go. And of course, the IRF has got a clear impact on a sweep. I know uh, in IRF, there is a uh, there is a different different direction uh, which mostly uh, will go in favor of the sweep. For example, you know how to uh, disconnect the illegal connection to the drains and uh, what are the penalties should be and uh, in, in business model uh, in the financial analysis and business model there is a clear suggestion to engage private sector which is uh, as I said the essence of uh, this model so all together I think uh, you know it would be a great uh, you know uh, framework uh, which will uh, within which the uh, street will be able to uh, grow more and more and uh, provide uh, services uh, to the city dwellers as well as uh, to be a money making game for the private entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Hassan. Um, I'm just going to put one more question to, to you before we move on. This is a question from Nomi de la Bros. Um, so you you mentioned Hassan the um, contractual clause that was introduced from the outset um, in Chittagong that that thirty percent of the customer base um, have to be low income um, in Dhaka that that wasn't present at the outset but was was subsequently introduced. Um, are you able to to say in relation to to Rangpur and Barisal will we include a thirty percent um, contractual clause from the outset or or? Or will we, um, as per the DACA experience, introduce that gradually over time? Of course, of course. You know, uh, in DACA, it was actually uh, it was a business in a very unconventional field. We, uh, we didn't have enough data to predict the market, to predict the business. Uh, so uh, we were very much skeptical. And uh, you know, uh, if our plan was uh, to make uh, it a lucrative business for the private sector, once it once there is money for the private sector. You know, uh, nobody should be there to make it sustainable. More and more private sector will be involved and uh, to continue uh, growing. So that's why uh, initially, as I said, I, we were very much uh, skeptical and we were very much in favor of the private sector uh, so that they can uh, operate the business smoothly and uh, we were trying to make the business uh, profitable as early as possible. That's why we were targeting the low hanging fruit first. That means in this case, you know, the high income and uh, low income, high income and institutional customers. But, you know, uh, as a, as a water and sanitation for the urban group, at the end, uh, we, we are uh, responsible and we are liable uh, to serve the urban poor people. So, and uh, as I find that uh, without have, having a clause like some uh, like this, uh, you know, uh, serving the LSU will fall in just equally. And when we put such a, a clause in the agreement, uh, it's showing a positive impact. So, of course, we would like to uh, start the way the, the green. Uh, like to replicate the street in uh, two other districts of Rangpur and Borishal with the same clause in the uh, contract from the beginning. Okay, that's 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 very clear. Uh, thank you so much again, Hassan. Apologies that there are some questions there that we can't cover um, because we're, we're aware of the time, but as I say, we will address these um, in a briefing document. Okay, we're, we're going to move on to our, our second presentation now. This is uh, going to be um, from Emmanuel Awako, um, who's our project manager in Kisumu, and he's going to talk about uh, another example, but a, a very different example of a public-private arrangement uh, for FSM services that we've been supporting. So over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. This is Emmanuel Awako, uh, presenting uh, Strengthening Enabling Environment for Urban Sanitation in Kisumu City. Kisumu City is one of the is one of the three big cities in Kenya, with a population estimated close to 400,000 people who are living in the uh, in the city, uh, and also majority 75% of these households rely on pit latrines, and they live in the informal settlements, the informal or unplanned settlements, which have loose soil in the areas that uh, make the pits most of the times collapsing. So the pits, for, for them to last for long, they are made to be a little bit small. And uh, the county government of Kisumu has few functioning vehicles for the sludge collection and transport. And this is coordinated by the, the only utility in the city called Kiwasco. So because of this, uh, a number of uh, 
landlords have changed to having manual emptiance to be the ones uh, conducting the informal emptying process. And uh, for us to be able to manage this, uh, was up, uh, made a decision to work with the public and the private sector to be able to regulate this. And uh, uh, we contract, uh, we, we, we were able to get into partnership with one of the private sector operators called Garcia Power. So Garcia Power uh, and lease the residents, uh, which are the households through their landlords. Uh, then they collect waste collection and transfer to the treatment facilities that is managed by the water utility called Kiwasco. And Kiwasco is a public sector company that is uh, formed and uh, managed under the devolved government uh, in the Kisumu County. And uh, the whole, uh, the major functions of the county government is to have licensing processes, regulation, and enforcement of the private sector operations in the in the in the treatment in the fecal slug management. So, under the Kisumu County, we also have the Public Health uh, Ministry that has the responsibility of training uh, the private sector operators on hygienic emptying processes, uh, uh, procedures for emptying and transportation. So they also undertake the enforcement responsibility to ensure that the sector is more regulated. So as was up, we've been able to create this uh, functional framework to be able to be operational and regulated. And by so doing, uh, we've been able to provide service uh, provide uh, capacity uh, support to the private sector by developing and strengthening the formal private sanitation service uh, providers. And by doing this, uh, we basically uh, support them in ensuring they have uh, emptying tools, having uh, their businesses more organized, uh, they're able to market, have business plans, and be able to offer quality service, emptying services, so that uh, people are able to, you know, get services that are hygienic, well uh, coordinated, and risk free uh, in the in the compounds. Regulatory effectiveness, as was up uh, working through the county government and the utility, we've been able to engage stakeholders to introduce regulations. This has been coordinated, this targeting regulations by having standard operating procedures that then spells out uh, the uh, process of emptying, process of transportation, safe disposal, and health and safety precautions that uh, must be adhered to. So as a, as a was up uh, in terms of uh, provision of capacity strengthening, we've been, we've been able to support the Power, one of the private operators, to be able to be compliant with the county government licensing standards uh, licensing standards like having, you know, manual MTS uh, immunized, they are free from, you know, health risks, and also we've been able to support them to have marketing and customer acquisition strategy so that they are able to reach out to customers, manage their customer expectations, and uh, provide quality services. Uh, more importantly, uh, this that's their power has also been supported in financial modeling and training. Uh, financial focusing more on you know, organizing the bookkeeping um, of, of the finance, customer database, ensuring that the, the MTS are trained on hygienic emptying process. And uh, uh, in strengthening the regulatory effectiveness, we were able to support uh, the county and, of course, other uh, stakeholders as a, as a team to develop standardized operating procedures in the city. And this then raises the minimum standards for emptying and disposal to ensure that uh, the, the health and safety precautions are adhered to. And uh, the SOPs uh, 
created extensive guidelines covering all the operations, emptying of waste, transport, disposal, customer acquisition, and ensuring that even the solids from the slag are, uh, are well managed thereafter. Accompanying this has been the training to improve enforcement, and the training has focused on building the capacity of the public health officers, uh, the public health officers, the utility staff, uh, the, man uh, the staff managing the treatment center to ensure that everybody adhere to the guidelines. Then uh, looking ahead as a team, both within the city, the private sector uh, players, and also uh, the, the utility, we, uh, we, and of course, with the experience gained already, we are looking at developing the SOP to be to feed into the county sanitation policy, which is in the process of development, that then will inform the wider uh, public-private partnership uh, arrangement that will also bring on board other service players within the city. Then also we are looking at other counties around the region to be able to adopt the fecal slag management approach and of course be able to address the challenges as we contribute towards the establishment of the national FSM regulations. Now, uh, within, at the national level, the, the environmental health and hygiene policy uh, envisages having a private arrangement with the fecal, fecal slag management teams but of course, uh, this has to be cascaded into the counties to be able to have a similar approach across the nation. So for now, I will call for any questions from the team in case there is. That's great, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you. And, and apologies for some of the, the distortion on the line there, but I, I think generally it was, it was clear. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a number of questions to, to put to you. Uh, I'll start with, with two questions around the, the treatment facilities. So a, a question from Andreas Lugwid. Are the treatment facilities dimension with sufficient capacity to treat uh, additional fecal sludge um, that, that would result from, from increased uptake of, of the services that you were describing? Um, and a question from, from John Smith. Are there any problems being experienced with the state of the the treatment facilities and the technical know-how of the operating staff which can influence the overall partnership so we'll, we've got some more questions but we'll start with those two thank you very much now the treatment facility is uh, we, we have the two treatment facilities managed under the by the utility and as now uh, the, uh, it has the capacity to to receive and uh, to be able to have the slide disposed in it with already screens installed uh, to be able to sieve off the solids that are uh, that are much in the in the in the sludge. So as of now, uh, that is the temporary solution that we have. But we are looking into uh, having a uh, having a more enlarged uh, facility because for now we have an incinerator being constructed to be able to manage the solids. The major challenge has been the solids arising from the from the sludge, uh, but is screened, uh, removed, dried, and then burned through the burning chamber to be able to ensure that uh, the solids get, don't get into the treatment facility. So that is a, a solution that we've had to be able to manage uh, the, the sludge at the treatment facility. Then the second one is that uh, the facility, uh, the staff at the treatment center they didn't have the technical know-how, but working through other partners uh, who have had experience in this process, we've been able to treat, uh, to, to train the team that is handling the disposal at the facility, same to the team that is disposing from Garcia Power, so that they, they have a common understanding and process on how the disposal should be done and how the solids should be screened and disposed of dried and burnt at the facility without causing any damage into the the whole process at the treatment center hello sam yep 
Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. So you've just mentioned about screening solid waste, and um, this relates to a, a question we've got from Richard Wilson, and we'll actually explore this this issue in um, a little more depth in the in the Zambia example to come. But Richard asks, is there a problem with solid waste and silt in the pits blocking manual pumps, um, such as the gulper? Um, and a question from from Dennis Moanza, uh, very significant question um, in the context of the partnership that we're supporting. Who has the actual mandate of ensuring sanitation is effectively undertaken, i.e. is it Coasco, county government or the county health um, department? Um, and he also asked what is the role of the national regulator, um, WASREB? Uh, so if you can expand on, on those two questions. Now, uh, the component of sanitation uh, for now within the county is uh, the whole, uh, the whole function of sanitation is still anchored within the county, um, the county government, but with a little responsibility given out in, uh, to the utility. So the utility is in charge of civil services, but we anticipate this to be, uh, to be more, to be addressed more within the sanitation policy and the bill that is being drafted to ensure that the separation of roles and institutional arrangements are well addressed. Now, the national regulator, uh, WASREP for now, uh, in the Kenya uh, environmental health and policy framework, it is envisaged that uh, there will be an authority to be able to regulate all the component of sanitation. But for now, uh, the, the most companies working under WASREP, uh, they, 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 they are dealing more with the sewerage services, while the other component of sanitation is largely within the Ministry of Health and other related public health ministries. But this is being harmonized with a new policy now being operationalized. Hello? Hello, Sam? Yes. Hello, Sam. Hello. Hello. Issues there with with Emmanuel. So we've we've got a number of uh, additional questions to to put to him, and, and and we'll try to come back to him. But for now, um, we're going to go on to our final presentation, which is um, from SIBO, business lead um, in Zambia. So thank you for that, Emmanuel. Hopefully, we can come back to you with, with questions. But for now, let's let's move to SIBO. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Sam. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, Sibo. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Sam said, I'm Sibo. I'm the business lead for um, uh, WhatsApp uh, Zambia. And so basically today I'll, I'll take you through a short presentation about strengthening uh, the enabling environment for urban sanitation in Osaka, Zambia. So just a brief background about uh, Lusaka. Lusaka is uh, Zambia's capital city. It has a population of about 1.7 million people and 70% of these people live in peri-urban areas. Um, so these households mostly rely on on-site sanitation facilities and this is unlikely to change in the nearby future. Um, what we have found is that due to the poorly constructed pitler trees, these two problems that are presented. The first one is that uh, because these pit latrines are not lined, there is a groundwater contamination, which the commercial utility Osaka Water is heavily concerned about, as well as the government. The second is that uh, due to uh, rains, these pit latrines tend to flood, and um, this uh, uh, causes a public health risk and makes the city susceptible to waterborne diseases such as cholera. So in response to these challenges, uh, WhatsApp um, started working with uh, Lusaka Water and Sewerage Company, which like I mentioned, is the 
commercial utility here in in Lusaka. And um, before Lusaka Water's mandate was solely uh, on water provision as well as sewer connections, uh, but with WhatsApp, we're able to um, demonstrate that there could be a solution that could be found in order for them to respond to the whole sanitation chain. So um, in 2013, WhatsApp uh, partnered with Lusaka Water to provide on-site sanitation services in, in Kanyama. And a year later, they did the same in Chazanga. And they did this through a delegated management model, uh, which is the Water Trust. And the Water Trust are basically uh, local uh, community-based uh, enterprises that were predominantly providing water services. But uh, Lusaka Water worked with this to take on um, um, sanitation service uh, provision. Um, so uh, WhatsApp has done quite a lot of work with Lusaka Water, but for purposes of this discussion, uh, we're limited to just two main uh, focus areas demonstrate the kind of work that we've been doing with the utility. Um, the first was basically a message on behavioral change, which is basically us communicating to the communities about the negative impact of disposing solid waste in pits. And uh, the second focal area was on infrastructure and technology, which was us trying to demonstrate that there could be infrastructure that would be able to respond to the challenges of um, managing uh, fecal sludge in Lusaka. And so to, to, to this uh, effect, uh, the main uh, messages that we would have in our annual campaigns was um, that uh, very urban communities should not dispose of solid waste in latrines. So what we found in our initial uh, studies was that people in very urban areas were using their pit latrines as garbage dumps. So we would find anything from pots, blankets, you name it, in the pits. And so it made it difficult for us to empty them with any form of mechanized equipment, say a galpa, because of the presence of solid waste. So in our annual campaign, we stressed this. Related to this campaign also was that of upgrading to a four flush toilet. And the four flush toilet really was responding to two main challenges. The fact that the inlet in a four flush toilet is small, it meant that we'd be able to curb the problem of solid waste. And also um, these are communities which are typically water stretched. So we didn't want to further put an extra burden on them when we introduce a waterborne on-site sanitation solution. So we propose uh, four flush toilets, which could basically um, uh, flush with just about two liters of water. And this was not confined to clean water, but could be done even with um, gray water. And that's uh, water which they've used, say, to clean their dishes or wash their clothes. With regards to infrastructure and technology, uh, with funding from the Stone Family Foundation and Comic Relief, WhatsApp worked with Lusaka Water to set up the first um, eco sludge treatment plant in Kanyama in August of 2013. And um, uh, what you see in the picture before you is um, drying beds, which is where we take um, the biosolids from the eco sludge treatment plant for them to dry. And we sell these uh, to, to farmers really for just um, landscaping purposes, because as it is now, we don't have um, standards for, um, for reuse of um, any product coming from Pico Sludge. Although at present through the, um, under the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, project, we're able to sit on the technical working group where we're developing minimum standards um, for on-site sanitation as well as FSM. So um, while this core of, this, uh, of the initial project was on infrastructure, with the Gates project, we try to respond to demonstrating sanitation as a business. So to do to do so, uh, one of my uh, the reasons why I came on board was because uh, Kanyama and Chazanga were both um, incurring quite a number of uh, losses, and so we were trying to um, ensure that um, they were operating efficiently. So I've been working with both. Um, Nyama and Chazanga Water Trust since um, 2016. 
in trying to ensure that we um, implement better business practices. So um, as a result uh, of demonstrating this pilot, both in Kanyama and Chazanga, Lusaka Water were able to recognize that their service areas would not be fully sewered in the uh, short, uh, short, uh, sorry, medium to long term due to uh, technical and social economic considerations. And so um, because of this, Lusaka Sanitation Program was born. And um, so the Lusaka Sanitation Program is being implemented, like I said, by Lusaka Water and Sewerage Company. It's, uh, it's, it's a citywide uh, sanitation project funded by the European Investment Bank, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and KFW. And um, we tried to ensure that the Gates project was linked to um, the Lusaka Sanitation Program. Uh, by refining it and ensuring that whatever lessons were being um, created under the Gates project would sink and also be useful for this for the Lusaka sanitation project. So um, I'll, I'll streamline this to three core areas in which we helped um, the Lusaka sanitation program. One of the key activities that we did under the Gates project was to develop a sanitation database in Kanyama. And this sanitation database really was mapping out all on-site sanitation facilities. And um, it was very detailed from uh, talking about the fill rate, the nature of the facility, distance from the main road, how many users were using the toilet. And uh, this gave the Lusaka Sanitation Project an idea of um, how they would respond to ensuring that on-site sanitation facilities were available. Because as it is, there's a problem of both um, supply and demand. So currently, um, uh, if people uh, want um, a more improved uh, sanitation facility for a very urban area, such as a four flush toilet, it is not readily available in the market. So through our research, we're able to show Lusaka Water that this, um, uh, that this uh, facility was, um, was demanded by the community but also even if they demanded it, supply was was not there so these are the lessons that we're able to show to lusaka water and they're trying to respond to the supply chain as well um the second activity that we did under the gates uh, project was um uh, undertake a research on financing mechanisms for sanitation so obviously this this was an underdeveloped and untapped market uh, most um, financial institutions had not considered sanitation before. So uh, WhatsApp has uh, worked with um, a number of institutions uh, in 2017, financing institutions, to be able to demonstrate um, the kind of um, challenges that are faced in the sanitation sector, both by um, the community members who would like to have a proper sanitation facilities, but also by possible um, service providers like say vacuum tanker operators or pit empties who would want to um, um, provide this service but like to, uh, lack the fin financing for, for any form of capital investment, say a vacuum tanker. Um, the third thing that we also did under the Gates project which informed the LSP is um, we, we conducted a private sector um, landscape assessment. So in this activity, we're basically trying to identify potential um, service providers who would help Lusaka Water um, provide this service. Like I said earlier, um, Lusaka Water's mandate uh, up to now has been confined to sewerage and water service provision. So therefore, um, they were considering how uh, they would uh, come up with um, a model, a private sector um, model in which the private sector could participate in this provision. So currently, um, WhatsApp advisory um, were recruited to uh, were contracted to uh, provide technical assistance for the development of FSM at a citywide level. And in this uh, particular uh, assignment, we are required to um, develop some partnership arrangements in which we are identifying local um, vacuum tank operators, uh, local pit MTs, and any uh, any other entrepreneur who is related to the sector or has an appetite or has the capacity to provide this service. We identify this and then uh, in the second phase of the project, we'll be working to build capacity 
capacity in these people to be able to provide this service. And so, uh, and also one of the key deliverables under this assignment is to develop a business plan for Lusaka Water, which is solely for Picos Large Management that they can use in the next um, three uh, to 10 years. And so um, the Gates project, in this case has been able to demonstrate that sanitation can be a business uh, and that um, Picos Large Management Services can be provided by the utility either wholly or uh, through um, public-private uh, partnership arrangement. Thank you. I'll take any questions if there are any. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Sibo. Um, so we've got a number of questions for you, uh, mostly on the theme of financing, firstly around the um, the FSM service and, and also around latrine upgrades. So I'll, I'll start with the FSM service. So this is a question from Eddie Perez, who, who asks whether these services are affordable to, to lower income households. And if not affordable, is there financing to, to subsidize the service? So that's uh, my first question, which I'll, I'll put to you, Sibo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so uh, before the service commenced, obviously we conducted a willingness to pay survey, and obviously it revealed that people were willing to pay, but not the prices that uh, were able to offer the service. However, the assessment also revealed that the um, uh, FICOS large management service that we we're providing was able to uh, respond to one key problem these communities do not have so much space in their yards. So whenever a particular train was full, what they would do is they would bury it and build another one. And the cost of that was four times more what we provide the service at. So once we came up with this pit emptying uh, service, we were able to see that they were serv serving money in the long run because they didn't have to um, dig a new pit every time the one that they were using is full and they were also saving land because they didn't even have enough space on their plots. Um, uh, under the, the citywide uh, project, which is where WhatsApp Advisory is working now, there is a subsidy for um, service provision for FSM, about 800,000 US um, dollars, mostly because this is the first time that the business is being scaled up. So in the initial phases, as we get the business running, um, there is a subsidy that has been provided, yes. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Um, and then some questions around uh, upgrades to, to poor flush latrines. We had a, a number of um, questions in, in this area from Andreas Ludwig, who, who asks if the peri-urban population are in the position to afford technical sanitation improvements. Um, Patrick Masks asks, do you have a, a pro poor strategy to support this upgrade? Uh, so if I can put those questions to you, if you can speak to that. Uh, another question along these lines, who funded the change from the normal pit latrines to poor flush toilets and, and how has uh, what has been the response um, by the residents of, of the peri-urban areas? Okay, so I'll start with the latter question. Um, so WhatsApp was able to demonstrate um, 11 poor flush toilets in Chazanga. It wasn't really to say that we we're funding them, but this was a pilot project to see how this could work. And under this premise, uh, Lusaka Water will be constructing 12,000 poor flush toilets under this particular project that I'm talking about. Now, um, the communities will not uh, uh, fully pay for these toilets. And so Lusaka Water will uh, pay for the substructure. And then, uh, so that's um, containment because that's the core um, uh, area of interest for them to ensure that we eliminate um, groundwater uh, contamination. And then the households will provide um, um, for the, for the superstructure. So like I said before, one of the uh, things that we're trying to respond to is should a um, should a, a person in the very urban communities fail or not be in a position to pay upfront? Uh, we're trying to see if we could introduce a form of financing mechanism through which uh, people in very urban communities could access um, some form of financing to be able to pay for that upgrade. And that's the process that I I, I spoke of earlier. Uh, we we were working with Open Capital Advisors with this, and we'll be concluding that work. Um, at the end of April. Uh, 
Great, thank you. Um, and a final question I'll, I'll put to you, Sibo, which is around um, menstrual hygiene materials and menstrual waste in, in pits. Um, do we have a, a strategy under this program to, to support that area? Okay, so uh, we we have, um, I think uh, earlier we had we spoke of our annual uh, behavioral change uh, campaigns, which is something that uh, we do uh, annually, and we also have a, a smaller scale campaigns which are done uh, every every quarter. The annual one is very big, uh, but we also have quarterly ones. And so in these campaigns, we work with um, the World uh, Development Committee, which are small units within the peri-urban areas. And these help us to disseminate information on menstrual hygiene and also uh, on uh, uh, solid waste management and how not to uh, uh, dump um, solid waste in particular trains. Um, this is an, an ongoing campaign as is understood anywhere in the world behavior check takes quite a while to change uh but we from the numbers that we do every time we're doing our m and e campaigns we've been able to um notice that there've been uh, some significant reductions in um in, in some of these trends okay excellent uh thank you sibo so before we move on to the next next stage of this session i mean there were some some very pertinent questions that we didn't have the chance to put to emmanuel um so emmanuel can i just check uh, are you there and are you are you positioned to to respond to some additional questions no i think those those technical issues are, are persisting um but as as mentioned, we we will address all questions um, subsequent to the webinar. Okay, so we're going to go on to something quite different now. Um, we're going to hand over to to my colleague uh, Rosie Renouf, um, who's research officer here at WhatsApp, uh, and Rosie is going to to give a, a short demonstration and and to talk you through the bottom line, which is a an online simulation that we've developed to to bring to life some of the realities of, of public private partnership. Um, in FSM and the businesses that, that sanitation, uh, the challenges that the sanitation businesses face. So over to Rosie. Bear with us, I was having some more technical difficulties, but we will resolve them, just one moment. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I think it says that it's Sam speaking, but it's actually me. Um, we did a <laughs> we did a brief switcheroo. Um, so anyway, as Sam was saying, we uh, wanted to take some of the learning that um, Hassan, Sibo, and Emmanuel have been explaining about. We wanted to share it in a different way. Uh, so in doing so, we designed a game called The Bottom Line, uh, subtitle Understanding the Business of Sanitation. So these are based on our experiences in the Gates program. Um, the idea is to put people who play this into the position of a business owner in a fictional city who wants to move into FSM. Uh, we didn't really want to just focus on the business side of things. We also wanted to communicate our underlying understanding of what urban uh, sanitation companies and businesses needed, which is some level of public support um, that the public sector, it's incumbent on them to provide. Uh, that could come in a lot of different forms it doesn't necessarily have to be direct it can be indirect uh, it could be licensing uh, access to public infrastructure 
uh, any of the various ways that, again, the three previous presenters have, have gone over. So uh, with that in, line, uh, in, in mind, I will try and access this uh, online so we can have a, a live playthrough. Bear with me if there are any technical details, it should be okay. Hey, there we go. Great. Um, so this is the, the introductory um, information that you see. So the fictional African city of Buffini. Uh, in this fictional city, 80% uh, of residents have no access to a sewer connection. So they are relying instead on toilets that are connected to pits and septic tanks. Uh, again, very similar to, to the experiences that the presenters have uh, explained already. So the idea is that you're a hypothetical waste management business owner in Buffini and you've decided to expand into FSM. So you've already got a, a decent amount of positive cash flow, but you'll need to maintain that. Um, and the game is set across four different levels and there are three questions each. So progress is measured by whether you can keep three different bars from hitting zero. Uh, these measure again cash flow, as I mentioned, um, government support and public health. And the four levels give a really simplified journey from starting up a business to citywide expansion. So it goes through startup, building a customer base, uh, monitoring and uh, maintaining a viable business and scaling up. Uh, we've also included random events. So these could be positive or negative and they can appear at any time. Um, Regardless of whether they're positive or negative, um, either way, they're going to impact your scores in some way. Um, this is to try and include some of the, the uncertainties that work in the sector brings um, and they are as well as based an experience as, as possible. So anyway, with that in mind, I'm just going to go through the first level with you guys just to, to show you what it's like and hopefully you'll be able to see that we've really tried to put some of the, the learning from the Gates program into this. So anyway, start game. So yeah, this is level one starting up. Um, you're an ambitious entrepreneur, you can find a way. Let's go ahead. Right, so the first thing is you need access to a vehicle or a vacuum tanker. Um, there are a number of financing options. Um, there are a number of trade-offs as well. So none of these are really the, the right answer, but there's some level of, of trade-off, not just um, about how much money you're going to pay, but there are potentially other, um, other impacts that could happen depending on which one you choose. So you could lease a vehicle from city government. Again, you'll have to pay a lease fee every month, but you hope it's manageable. The second option is to buy a vehicle upfront using the money that you've earned from your pre-existing business. Or the third option is to apply for a commercial loan, which could have high interest rates, but otherwise you might not be able to access that much capital. So I'm just gonna pick one. I'm gonna lease a vehicle from the city government. This is, I hope you're, um, you can recognize this is what happened in uh, Dhaka and Chittagong. So I'm gonna choose that one and go next and see what happens to my scores. So because I chose to lease, the cash flow go down a bit, but um, on the other hand, because you've entered into an agreement or you started to build a relationship with the government or the local government, the government support has gone up. So let's continue on to the next one. Uh, staffing, so you need to employ people. Um, how will you balance salary costs with operational efficiency? This is always a question that comes up. Uh, you can hire two staff right away. Uh, you can spend a few weeks recruiting to experienced staff or you can uh, recruit four people with a range of skills. So I, again, there's no particularly negative answer or particularly positive answer. I'm going to choose to hire four people. Again, let's see what happens with the scores. Right, so cash flow has gone a bit down because of salary costs, but government likes that you're employing more people. So that's gone up a bit. And the last bit of level one, uh, training, equipment and support. Again, I hope this, this is um, familiar to you, um, having heard particularly about the standard operating procedures in Kasumu. So your employees are doing dangerous work and they may be exposed to fecal waste. There are regulations that you should be complying with, but you'll also need to keep your costs down. So you have an option about what level of support you'll provide for your employees. Um, so you can either provide immunizations and health insurance um, and maybe skimp a bit on the protective equipment and just provide the basic or get the protective equipment right, but not necessarily uh, pay for immunizations and insurance, or on the other hand, offer everything. Um, again, there is some level of trade-off. You could be, if you chose one of these two, you might gain financially in the short term, but 
the local government might not like that you're not um, complying with all of their regulations. So with that in mind, I'm going to offer the full works. I go next. Yeah, so you've paid a lot. So you've lost a bit of cash flow, but on the other hand, it's had a positive impact on public health and it's also had a positive impact in terms of your government support. So that's the end of level one. Uh, so you've overcome some of the barriers. Uh, you've accessed capital to procure a vehicle. The city government's granted you a license and your team's in place. So the next stage is building customer base. So you're fairly sure that the customer base is out there, but you need a good strategy to, to access them. And this is one of the random events that I mentioned earlier. So in this particular case, it's a positive one, which is great. So there's a new mayor and she's introduced a new tax support sanitation. And this has led to various benefits for your business, including access to cheaper credit and pit emptying vouchers for low income customers. Um, so that's, that's a very positive one. It could easily have been a negative one. And I think that's probably as far as I will play through with you guys. So I want to encourage you to play it rather than for me to show you the whole way through. Um, you can access this on our website. I think it's on the front page of our website now. So anyway, um, there we go. Uh, I'll go back onto Sam's PowerPoint. Great, thank you, thank you so, oh, thank you so much, uh, Rosie, for that demonstration. Um, so that was just to give you a taste. Uh, you know, there are there are four levels to that game, um, and you'll find out if you play it that we've tried to engineer it in such a way that it is um, it's not straightforward to succeed and to achieve scale as as it should not be because obviously we're, we're operating in a very challenging sector um, and it is an online scenario um, it's not a, a literal representation of how it works it would be impossible to account for, for all of the variables involved in, in developing a sanitation business um, but we hope you find it interesting and, and and give you some food for thought so we do encourage you to, to play it okay so what we're going to do now, we haven't received any questions on the game, but if, if you play it, then by all means, um, get in touch with us after the, the webinar. Uh, what we're going to do now is is just close this out by, by bringing this back to the sector functionality framework, which uh, we outlined at the beginning of the webinar, uh, where we are um, in using that framework um, as an evaluative tool and, and how we plan to use it um, looking forward. So I, I thought it would be useful to share just the, the evaluation process um, that we have, have undergone um, using this framework. So we have just completed the last of, of six um, baseline assessments of sector functionality um, across our country program. So we had the, the last assessment in Lusaka earlier this month. Um, we're doing this in collaboration with Oxford Policy Management. So this is a, an externally led um, evaluation and just to talk about the assessment process, so the, the core of it are stakeholder workshops involving all of our institutional partners and beyond. So those include utilities, uh, municipalities, regulators, private sector representatives. So we bring all of those stakeholders together. And the idea is to develop a, a negotiated consensus on, on where the, the sector is across each of these indicators. So before the workshop, we, we invite um, each of the representatives to complete a survey, a confidential survey, where they give their score, um, whether that's zero, low, medium, high, their perception of where the sector is according to each of these indicators. Then we bring those stakeholders together. We show um, the, the aggregate scores of, of the survey and, and then there's some internal discussion and, and often some internal quite strong debate. And then we arrive at, at negotiated consensus. And just to give you um, an example of what that looks like. So these are the results from the assessment in, in Bangladesh on sanitation. Uh, and you can see that this highlights quite clearly um, the work that, that is ahead um, to progress in, in many of these areas. Uh, so our long term aspiration really is to position city authorities to prioritise effectively. I think you can you can see from from the nature of the framework um, and the output that, that hopefully it is a useful tool for doing that and and also provide uh, stakeholders with a with a space to to, to step back and, and reflect on where they are and what needs to be done. Um, to get to the point of a functional sector and, and, and to reorientate towards sort of long term system strengthening, which is, of course, always a huge challenge um, for institutions that are typically just trying to keep pace with um, with the scale of change and, and rapid rural to urban migration. 
so that's where we are um, with the sector functionality framework um, and if you have questions on the framework if you'd like more detail on on the scoring and guidance then please get in touch and we'd be happy to provide that okay uh, two things remain before we wrap this up first of all uh, a huge thank you to um, the donors that have supported this work so um, the free country presentations that you've been that you've heard about today they're all as, as we outlined part of our program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, but a number of other donors have also contributed to this work those include Stone Family Foundation, Comet Relief, um, UK Aid, so Department for International Development and, and UNICEF. And finally um, thank you for attending um, Huge thank you to our presenters, to Hassan, Sibo, Emmanuel, Rosie. Uh, we do encourage you to, to go on the WhatsApp website, get in touch with us via, via Twitter, or you've got the email there. Um, and, and just to urge you also to have a look at, at some of the resources that we have online in this area. So we've produced um, a range of publications on this theme, for example, a guide to, to strengthening the enabling environment for fecal sludge management that brings together all of the case studies that you've heard about today. Um, so do look into that. Uh, we will follow up with uh, a briefing note in the next few days. So look out for that. And we hope you found it interesting and um, bye for now. <laughs>